Welcome to the NYU Steinhardt Jazz Interview Series, and tonight we have one of the great vocalists in the world, Miss Janice Siegel. Thank you. Hello. You know what a loyal and hearty hand clasp is? Is that what I just gave you? No. You have to watch the movie The Bank Dick with W.C. Fields. Okay, I don't know that. All right, well, we'll talk later. Sure. Janice, I, I've known you for a long time now. And so uh, I've decided that instead of uh, rehashing your career, we just talk. And uh, if you want to learn more about Janice Siegel's life, you can read my interview with her in, in my book. How about that? That was a nice plug. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I didn't give the title, but... Uh, <laughs> But it'll scroll under. It'll come up here. <laughs> so, all right. So, how many how many years have you been a professional <coughs> musician? Meaning, Meaning how, singing for money. Yes, pay for play. Since I'm twelve. Wow. Years old. So, okay. And uh, I mean, we were just talking before, and you had made the comment. You were too lazy to do other things. Well, I, I really wasn't planning on being a professional musician, honestly. Mm -hmm. Even though I was singing and making records in my teen years, mm -hmm. as early as, as 12 and 13. I, wanted, I was interested in the sciences. I was interested in first marine biology, and then I, I got a nursing scholarship to State University of New York at Buffalo, which is where I went. And... Um, but I was still singing. I was still flying home to do demos and, and uh, very much involved in music. Well, let's talk yeah. about that scene because maybe that whole scene is totally different today where some people, hey, let's, you need to fly home and do a demo. You need, we need no, you on stage. No, it's a completely different, completely different scene. And, uh, well, just describe this because you grew up in New York. Yeah, Brooklyn. well, that, that really informed my musical life in a, in a big way. Uh, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and even though my parents were not <clears throat> big music lovers or musicians, in any, and no one in my family was, we had the AM radio, <clears throat> which at that time played a very wide uh, swath of music, different styles and instrumentals as well as, as uh, the British Invasion, but also Great American Songbook and really good singers <clears throat> like Edie Gourmet, and who I love, and uh, Frank Sinatra. Did you ever meet Edie Gourmet? I met her in a ladies' room. She, I met her in a ladies' room. <laughs> she was a little squiffy. Wow. And uh, I don't, I, our, our, our conversation was really of no consequence, but I was starstruck, you know, eating gourmet. Well, when you meet somebody in the ladies' room, you blame it on the bossa nova. Yes, always. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> um, what was the question? I don't remember. Thank yeah. you. That was a great interview. <laughs> no, no, it was about being serious. It's about very yeah. serious. Uh, being a nurse seemed awfully serious, life and death and all. And what did your parents do? My parent, my father was a, um, when I was growing up, he was a haberdashery salesman on 49th and Broadway, Harry Kotler, um, right near the Ed Sullivan Theater. So are you into hats? Haberdashery is, for those that don't know, is just shirts and ties, oh. cufflinks, that's it. I no, guess that's chapeau, coiffure and yes, chapeau. Yes, exactly. But uh, my father had a degree in chemistry, actually, <clears throat> from Brooklyn College. But the family's myth is that he was, they weren't hiring Jews uh, at the time he got out of college in the field that he wanted to go in. So he, he had a family. And so your father was uh, World War II generation? Yes, absolutely. He was, in, he was a uh, meteorologist in World War wow. II and helped with the Normandy invasion. Wow. But uh, for years he worked selling men. He was a great salesman, very friendly, personable. And, and all the people, the guys that would play on it, would perform on Ed Sullivan, if they, need, they usually needed, oh, I need a, a, a tie, a new tie. They would all go in there and buy from him. So, so did he meet Ed Sullivan? I don't know if Ed Sullivan 
himself came out. But there were there were pictures all over the store. Did he Paul meet, Anka and Did he meet Hank Jones? I don't know. Because Hank was the pianist with Ed Sullivan. No. Yeah. In the house band? Yeah. Oh. Wow. Didn't know that. Yeah. But that's You probably that, met him. Probably. Maybe didn't know. Probably Hank needed a shirt and a tie. Right. You know. I don't know. At some point. Anyway, uh, then my father, uh, when we were sort of growing up and we were, some of us were out of the house, my father went back to school and <clears throat> went to the printing business. So he renewed his chemistry interest. Uh, and my mom was a, was a housewife. Housewife. And you have any siblings? I have three brothers. Mm. All three brothers. Um, they're all vastly different. We'll talk about that in a minute, all too. Right. Okay. Yeah. None of them are musicians. None are musicians. We are all vastly different. One is a hairdresser, one is an economist, and one is a um, works for uh, Tanium, which is a security, cybersecurity organization. Mm -hmm. So what is your family? Do they think you were crazy going into music and... What happened when you became successful? Well, um, I mean, again, I sang all through high school, so there was nothing new, making records, but I didn't think of it as a career. Uh, and then there was a point where we were going to be signed by, uh, who was the guy? Uh, some big promoter who maybe ran the bitter end. And had something to do with the Beatles. Anyway, he we had a meeting with all the parents. What about we should send them to professional school? And all our parents said no, no, no. We want them to stay in school and be anything but musicians. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, one one of the girls I sang with became a lawyer, and one went into computers, mm. and then I. I left school, I left nursing, and uh, decided to become a singer when I was about, really focus on it, when I was about 17. Well, we were talking about Edie I'm Gourmet 17. before. Hmm? Edie Gourmet, and I mentioned the Bossa Nova. All that stuff was really super popular. What, 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 what did you think when uh, the Beatle and uh, the British invasion hit and the Beatles? Oh, God, I went nuts. I went nuts. I mean, I loved that first Beatle, Meet the Beatles record. You didn't go out to the airport to see I it. didn't do any of that business. Even then, I was, like, wary of large mm -hmm. <laughs> gatherings of screaming girls. <clears throat> no. Nope. Yeah, I didn't go to Shake Stadium or anything. Like that I just liked to listen to the records and play them and learn them on the guitar. I played guitar at that time. Yeah. I don't remember uh, Manhattan Transfer plays the Beatles. I don't <laughs> that would be a good. Uh, uh, that would be a good uh, concept. <clears throat> okay. I mean, I ended up. I'm up recording um, with Fred Hirsch. Mm -hmm. we, we we looked at the Beatles songbook, and we ended up doing um, for no one, which we both felt. We both felt that the Beatles recording was antithetical to the actual meaning of the lyric, which was tragically sad mm. and yet the the music was very jaunty jolly so we slowed it down considerably put it in the key of d flat minor the saddest key of all and uh and extended the measures a bit so it was it's really a beautiful sad song mm. you know uh the stream of consciousness this is what this interview is going to be got it i'm there uh, um now I lost the drugs my, are kicking in, and I'm going with you. <laughs> so, uh, I, we mentioned the Beatles, and I don't, I don't know if they, if they've ever checked out your music or Manhattan Transfer, but uh, Ringo was on uh, our record, one of our records. Which record? Uh, second record. What did he do? He played the drums. Silly. On, on which? Uh, <laughs> on your second record, which, which one was Which was that? coming out. Richard Perry produced oh. in L.A. He played drums. He played. He and Jim Keltner played together. What song together. was it? They played in Zindi Lou, uh. and I think maybe one or two others. Mm. Yeah. Well, my question was more: when you get celebrities in your, in the audience, and what is that? Uh, 
does that kind of uh, signify something for you that people, you, you have like a broad fan base? Well, I mean, the first time, I mean, that happened a couple of times in our career. <coughs> Here in New York, when we first started, we were playing a lot of underground clubs in places like Max's Kansas City. Yeah. And... Um, and kind of freaky events like a boat cruise around Manhattan with Eric Emerson and the Tramps and Jackie Curtis. And um, we, we were on the same bill with Mingus, actually, at Max's. Wow. Um, so uh, there were a lot of the New York cognoscenti that would come see us. But when we went to, to LA, that was a whole nother level. When we played, at the Roxy Theater and all the movie stars were starting to come. That was nuts. That was wow. really nuts. So and we had, a, we had a TV show, for God's sake. Who in their right mind would give us a TV show? <clears throat> CBS. And was, what was that, 75? Yes. That was one year after your first record? Yes. Mm -hmm. So that came yeah, quickly. We, we, that... Well, we went from playing like uh, <clears throat> Trudy Heller's and Reno Sweeney's, these little cabarets, and um, and gay clubs to a national television show on Sunday night at seven. So, so. how does that happen? Let's ex let's unpack that for everyone. Mm. Mm. It's easy. I think it happened because of our manager at the time, mm -hmm. who was a very powerful man mm. and a very persuasive man. And he his name was Aaron Russo, and he managed Bette Midler as well. Mm -hmm. So he just made it happen. He just made things happen. Like, like So, that. well, how did you get such a powerful manager in the first place? Because Bette was a friend of Tim's. Ah. And, uh, and Tim, Bette said to Aaron, you got to go hear this group. Wow. So did you ever work with Bette Midler? Um, we did. Um, we did a duo with her of Gonna Take a Miracle on our tone and record. We shared the lead. I shared the lead with her. And we, we uh, sang on her record. We sang a tune called Up, Up, Up. Hmm. Yeah. We shared a lot of sensibilities with repertoire and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, she was a supporter. Wow. So let's talk about Tim Hauser for a minute because mm -hmm. he was really the brainchild, right, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of Manhattan Transfer. Um, how did all that start? It's like uh, I know that he was—he loved seventy-eight records, and he would, you guys would get together and listen to music. Was there a point where he said we need to do this, or was that always in his brain? Oh, it was always in his brain. But he was—he was, he was fr also uh, very, very open when it came to music. He loved Stockhausen. He loved bluegrass. He loved the, the Four Freshmen. He loved the uh, Kingston Trio. I mean, he, he loved Dave Van Ronk. Uh, and he loved the Pied Pipers. So really, if there was any group that was a model for the Manhattan Transfer, it was the Kingston Trio, I think, because of the eclecticism within the genre that they chose. Within the genre of folk music, the Kingston Trio did a wide swath of um, world music, songs in different languages, different styles within the folk genre. And we took that as a model to just be a vocal group that explored American music, styles of American music. So if he would have started, he would have started Manhattan Transfer 10 years earlier, it would have been a folk group. Maybe, yeah. maybe he was in a folk group, the oh, Troubadours yeah. 3 or something like that. And he was in a doo-wop group. Too. So what was his musical background? Did he, was he studied? No. No. <clears throat> he, was, um, he was in a doo-wop group, I think at high school maybe, called the Criterions. Mm -hmm. And then he, he went into advertising, which kind of helped us in a way. Mm -hmm. I mean, marketing. Instead of dog food, it was the Manhattan Transfer. Wow. <laughs> he was, you know, he had some skills with that. And he, and he studied economics in school, I believe. He went to Villanova. But when you met him, he was a taxi driver. Well, that's a nut, nutty story. Didn't I cover that in the, your book? You did. We'll stop this segment, read the book, come back. 
All right, you can tell this story. Well, the story is so phenomenal, it really is. I mean, I can hardly believe it myself, but he was a cab driver. He, he, there, was in a, there was another Manhattan transfer group <clears throat> that was signed to Capitol Records. They made one record called Jukin, and Capitol paired them with a Nashville songwriter named Gene Pistilli. So I don't know why, but it was Gene Pistilli and the Manhattan Transfer. Mm -hmm. So there was this, I think, I think what broke them up really was the conflict between the songwriters and the group, Gene, and Tim wanting to do this 40s kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, I heard Java Jive on the radio by them and on WNEW, and I, I went insane. And I said, what is that? I had, what is that? It's so great. So I was aware, but they disbanded, they kicked him out of the group, I think, is what happened. And um, they, they tried to continue, and Tim needed to make a living, so he was a construction worker, and then he got a cab license, which he really liked, because he could meet people, he could network, he could stop, stop the cab if he wanted, he could go over, all over the city, he could, he used to jerry-rig the, um, meter so that it wouldn't show, do thing, I think there's a term for it, taking rides uh, illegally, you know, if you had a customer that it, it would, so then you could pocket the whole ride. Mm. I don't know if I should What's be saying What's the term? This. Say the term. We can no, I, I don't remember what the oh. term is. Um, off the meter. It's kind of off the meter oh, kind of thing. We'll have to cut you, that yeah, out. Yeah, you, you, you sort of short out the, um, the light on top. Mm. It's all, it was all thing. Can't but do anyway, that now. Tim actually picked up Laurel Massé, my original female partner, in the cab. And she was a cocktail waitress at the time. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. It's, yeah, so she got in the cab. He, he looked like a freak. Uh, so she said, What do you do besides drive a cab? What do you do besides drive a cab? And he said, I'm a musician. And I had a group called the Manhattan Transfer, and she said, no, shit. That's what she said. She slapped her leg and said that, and said, let's go out for coffee right now. So they did. Wow. And he took her number to come sing on a demo that he was doing. And I met him through the cab as well with a group I was singing with. I mean, I was just about to get a record deal on my own with my group when I met him. And... Um, he took my phone number and I showed up at the session and that's how me and Laurel and Tim got together. So Manhattan Transfer over all these years, what did you guys score, nine Grammys? Ten. Ten. Seventeen nominations, I think. Wow. So who was your competition? Uh, well, there was no competition early on. Um, so, I mean, it's hard to place this Back in 74, there's no competition. So you, this explains why you got on television so early. It's like mm, you were really We were unique. a freakish kind yeah. of entity. I mean, we were determined to bring back four per harmony singing to popular music. Mm -hmm. That's what we wanted to do. Well, I think you did it. I don't. Yeah, I mean, now there's the New York Voices, there's Accent, there's all of these wonderful, wonderful groups that I think are, you know, the result of of the transfer sort of blazing it. But the difference is that I think that <clears throat> we were uh, we were not defining ourselves as a jazz vocal group or a pop vocal group. We just did what we wanted. But we had pop hits. Mm -hmm. Boy from New York City was a top ten hit. So it gave us a visibility and um, that maybe some of the other groups don't, don't didn't have or don't have. It's it would help. Well, I was just uh, again I'm thinking about strange stuff, but Twilight Tone. Did you have Rod Steiger talk on that, or was that That was it? Alan. That's my partner, Oh, that Alan, was Alan. Doing okay. a Rod Serling Rod's, imitation. I'm sorry, Rod Serling. Yeah. Rod Serling, who had no upper lip. Right. So Alan, Alan would, would imitate imitated him. Did it start submitted for your approval? Yeah. yeah. Submitted for your approval, yes. Right. You are entering a dimension. 
of sight, sound, and mind. Thank you for that. Okay. <laughs> Rod Serling. Serling. I'm sorry for Rod Steiger fans. Rod Steiger's great. Make no mistake. All right, now do your Rod Steiger impersonation. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> so let's talk about all these people that became peripheral. Well, not even peripheral for you. All these people that we don't associate with you. When, when I walked in, uh, our camera crew was playing Jocko Pastorius. So you have a connection to Jocko via Joe Zavinul because you did Birdland. Yes. So we talk. did it when jo uh, uh, Jocko was out of the group and possibly passed. Yeah. Because <clears throat> I remember Victor Bailey was mm. pay playing bass. Yeah. Um, I don't really have a connection to Jocko. Right. Except Which... I was a fan, of course. But he did live in my neighborhood, so I used to see him around. And, and the Brecker brothers had a club called Seventh Avenue South, which is right across the street from where I live. And Jocko was in there all the time. And that's where you met Michelle Camillo. Yes, that is where, uh, yes, how did you know that? Well, because I interviewed Michelle Camillo oh. and he talks about you. Yes. So talk about that club, 7th Avenue South. I think it was really. It was a scene. A scene. Yeah. It was a total scene. There, was a, there were a bunch of musicians, great musicians, that lived on Carmine Street, which is like one block away from me and one block away from 7th Avenue South. Um, Don Grolnick, Liz, Dave Sanborn, Will Lee, Steve Kahn, they were all like this group. Mm -hmm. And um, they used to hang at 7th Avenue South. The, Randy and, and Michael opened the jazz club. And it was a great hang, a very dangerous hang, actually. Why? Uh, there was a lot going on. There was a lot yeah. going on. Yeah. But there was a lot of music going on. So much music. What did you hear there? <sighs> well, because I lived across the street, I had binoculars by my window, <laughs> and I could see who was on stage based from my window. And I'd go, I, one, one, thing I, <laughs> one thing I remember clearly that blew me away was Carmen Lundy. Mm. She was doing a project with a string quartet, I think. So I remember seeing her there. I mean, I just would see anybody who was playing, all the cats. But I mean, that was kind of the New York scene where you never know who's watching. So you saw, for instance, Michelle Camilo. And, yes. And you heard this song that you thought it should become part of yeah, I had transfer. And then he, he got lyrics uh, written. Julie Eigenberger, I think was her name. And he, yeah, and then he, I asked about the song. It was called Manhattan Carnival, mm -hmm. the instrumental version. And uh, Julie wrote these lyrics called Why Not? And he, uh, he sent me the demo. And I went, yeah, I went, yeah, this is... This is good. I'm going to arrange this. Mm -hmm. And it won a Grammy. Right. Yeah. Well, how many, how many times did that happen? <laughs> that you, you were at a club or you heard somebody and you say, wait a minute. That I'm... happens a lot. I mean, it happened for me. I mean, because I'm always listening for something. What about the random again, the Spire Gyro tune? Shaker song? Shaker, yeah. Well, if I could go back to State University of New York at Buffalo, you know that I went to school with Jay Beckenstein. Okay, so now that makes sense. Right? Yeah. I went to school with him, and um, we hung out a lot. And uh, I sang with him occasionally. He was just putting, the group was put together up in Buffalo. Mm -hmm. Jeremy Wall was the original pianist. <clears throat> and um, I, I can't, I don't think Jay recommended we do Shaker Song. I think I heard it. And we and everybody and the group I played for the group and everybody loved it. We commissioned Allie Willis to write the lyrics for Shaker Song. Mm. The Fool Screams No More. And she wrote this crazy, surreal little story. You, he can't shake her. He can't shake her. Mm. <laughs> wow. It's a great, great version. I, I love that rendition of yours. Thanks. And Richie Cole's playing the uh, solo. Right. Well, 
Let's talk about Richie Cole for a minute. Okay. What about Richie Cole? <laughs> well, we met Richie Cole when he was uh, Eddie Jefferson's musical director. So Richie Cole, people don't know who that is. Richie Cole is, a, is an alto saxophone player, protege of Phil Woods, I would say, right? Mm -hmm. um, when I met him, I was dazzled by his brilliance. The sound was like a diamond, mm -hmm. and his ideas fresh and, and flowing so fast. Um, he lived in a van. He lived in a blue van. and um, Was it parked somewhere? Or? Wherever he hung his head. It was wow. Home. Yeah. I mean, he just, he didn't live anywhere, you know. Uh, but he was Eddie's musical director. It was really Tim that sniffed out that scene. Like, we have to get involved with Eddie, Eddie Jefferson, you know, we have yeah. to. And what was Eddie Jefferson like? <laughs> he was... I should say, what color was his van? <laughs> no, Eddie was different in that way. I heard him sing so many... I mean, I went on the road with them mm -hmm. just to, as, to hang. I have, at home, I have cassettes of, of sets of, of Eddie and Richie, which I have to find and digitalize somehow, but... I heard a lot of Eddie Jefferson and went on the road with them and listened to him every night. I mean, as much as I love John Hendrix, uh, Eddie's like a rougher version. He, Eddie was rough and raw and um, unexpected, whereas John was kind of brilliant and following changes and stuff like that, but Eddie was wild. And his lyrics, too, are wonderful, very different than John's. Mm -hmm. John's are more literary, in a way, you know, quoting Shakespeare and, uh, you know, talking about esoteric philosophies within his lyrics. But Eddie was, was kind of raw. And to hear that every night was an education. And my big thrill would to be get up, to, to get up and sing uh, Moody Spood with him. Wow. Yeah. And I wasn't scatting at that point either. I was too much too afraid. <laughs> so, but I was listening. So did Eddie know guys like King Pleasure? Yeah, he must yeah. have. Yeah. I wish now I would have talked more to him. Mm. He was chasing a lot of young girls mm. at that time, but so. it was a different time. It was a different time. Yeah. And it was, you know, I don't know if you guys know, but yeah, he was tragically murdered uh, outside a jazz club in Detroit. And that what, was. What year was that? Mm, I don't remember. Probably 80s, in the mm. 80s. You know, uh, we were talking about Joe Zavano. And so, what part did he have in, in producing Birdland? Well, he really didn't have any any part in it uh, in the our record, yeah. but he did come and listen to the final mix. Okay, and he was very sweet and forgiving in some ways. He, his comment was the bass isn't loud enough. Mm. That was his comment, and it, it was terrifying for me because I was singing his synthesizer solo at the end. <laughs> 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 you know, but he was very supportive, and we did bit of work with him, because he was getting really interested in writing for vocals. Mm -hmm. So we were a, a bit of a guinea, guinea pigs for him. We did another record for a Weather Report um, album. We did a tune called Anywhere the Moon Goes, which is, I think, probably the hardest thing I have ever sung in my life. Rhythm Rhythmically, I just couldn't figure it out. Could not. Nope. I mean, it, harmonically, it was not difficult, but the rith the way he felt rhythm was out of my league, really. Uh, we managed to do it somehow. He also wrote an arrangement for us that we never recorded of Easy Living. Like, <laughs> it, it, will, it will melt your brain if you hear this. I wow. mean, the chords are so out. Well, I'd like to hear that <laughs> yeah, one. Of course you would. Um, Let's talk about some other people you worked with. I think Stan Getz. Yes. Yes. Also a lovely man with us uh, in, our, in our sphere. Um, 
always liked to joke with us. We, uh, whenever we'd sit in with him, we'd do Joy Spring, and he'd play on that. Mm -hmm. uh, he was involved with Stanford, I believe, Stanford uh, Jazz, Jazz Court, Department. Yeah. yeah. So we did some. We did a benefit, and uh, and he played on Capine. He played on a mm -hmm. Brazil record, which was gorgeous. We recorded this Javan tune in Portuguese, and he played the solo. What about the other Brazilians? Um, on that record? Yeah. Um, one interesting collaboration on the record was a group called Wakti. And they made their own instruments from PVC pipes, and they were all tuned. And they composed music using these, these uh, percussion instruments. So we have them. They, they constructed little arrangements for themselves on two of our tunes. One is Agua, and I forget which other one they played on, but extraordinary. We did, we did one session down in Brazil. Mm. Yeah, and, the re and the, uh, a lot of the arrangers are, are LA guys, mm -hmm. like Jeff Lorber and um, uh, Larry Williams, mm -hmm. sax player. You know, let's go back to you for a minute and talk about, because you were doing the arranging, most of the vocal arranging for the group, correct? For a while. For a while. So how long did it take you to not only learn that, mm. right, but mm -hmm. then uh, how long did it take you? Because you guys put out a lot of records. We did. Well, I, again, I, I learned by doing it and making mistakes and listening to other vocal arrangements. Mm -hmm. And asking questions. I mean, one incredible experience I had when I was arranging, uh, I did a lot by ear. I just, I hear the chords. Mm -hmm. Gene Perling taught me a lot, a lot, just by analyzing his arrangements and working with him, you know. He, we would get a cassette from Gene Perling with every arrangement he sent us with him slowly playing the chords and explaining why he did things and well you could also do if you're going to do that then you could also do this and you know incredible priceless stuff but i was uh, arranging four brothers right that's... jimmy jufri's four brothers uh, that the woody herman band put out and uh, with all the solos and everything the four brothers was perfect for us we thought you know because there were four of us. And I had started arranging it. Take a seat and cool it, because unless you overrule it, that's tight. I, uh, close harmony. You know, the notes are close together physically. You know, so it gives this creamy sound, very mm -hmm. emotional. So Jimmy, I show it to Jimmy Jufri. And how did you meet Jufri? I don't remember how I met him, but I ended up in a room with a piano with him. And it might have been a recording session, I don't know, or of some other recording session, but I ended up with him. And he said, How, why don't you open up the voicing at Four Brothers, Four Brothers, start in unison, and then open up the voicing. And I said, what does that mean? <laughs> so that was like a major, major new world opening up. And um, I did study privately. I, I, ha I had to. Uh, I studied the Schillinger system of musical mm -hmm. composition with Bobby Anko uh, out in Queens. It was the same as um, Eddie Palmieri did, and, and the Brecker brothers both studied with him. And I studied 12-tone theory, which was totally useless, but intellectually fun. Yeah. So I don't, I don't remember hearing any Manhattan transfer 12-tone. There, but, uh, there are none. Yeah. But... Uh, yeah, I did a lot of arrangements for um, vocalese. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite thing to do, I think, is adapt voices uh, based on an instrumental. So how close was it? How long did it take you to shape these arrangements, to hear the harmony properly? Uh, we used to rehearse a lot. Um, again, none of us, except Alan, Really, we're trained musicians. None of us went to school for music. Alan got a, actually got a degree to teach music. Mm -hmm. um, so he's the only one of us, really. So we 
when we first started, we rehearsed uh, six months. We rehearsed five songs for six months. And then we performed. And our goal was to sing like complicated pieces and also move. And also move and, and try and express them visually as well. And perform, mm -hmm. not just stand there and sing, which would have probably been enough, but we didn't. Because that was a nod back to the, the, the Pied Pipers and... Yeah, that, I mean, the groups, the, big, uh, the Pied Pipers was a big influence on us. You know, the, 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 the um, big band vocal groups. Uh, the beautiful, beautiful sound of that of those groups, uh, but Lambert Hedges and Ross would stand there as well. Mm -hmm. Now there's another two, two or three that we need to talk about. So you knew uh, Hendrix and Ross. Yes, mostly John. Yeah. Unfortunately, I mean the guy I really would have wanted to meet was Dave Lambert. Yeah, right. Yeah, because he did the vocal arrangements mm -hmm. for for um, Lambert Hedges and Ross. And he had the Dave Lambert singers before that. And he, he could keep up with John Hendricks improvising. Well, here's the crazy thing, because I met John years ago, and, uh, and I interviewed John and uh, Annie together, and, the, and they, neither of them read music. Yes, right? that's right. But, and, they, and I asked them, do you read music? And Well, actually, no, and I'm insulted when somebody asks me as, if I do. And it was kind of like a mechanism, I think, to say, well, we're artists. And, but it's like, it's interesting because they, they probably had a photographic memory of all the... Who, John? John. Yeah. Um, John would do things by ear. Mm -hmm. John would, would do things by ear. But, I mean, all the lyrics that he had memorized. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But what about, I, there's one thing I want you to talk about is uh, your version of Night in Tunisia. Mm -hmm. With the so Charlie Parker alto break, sung by John Hendricks, it's one of the most amazing things I've ever heard. It's amazing, and uh, we watched him do it. And his his comment was, uh, "You just have to get to the word bed. I mean, once, just get to the word bed. So it's but for your bed, <laughs> and that's the downbeat." <laughs> So he would just get there. Wow. But you can understand what he's saying. I know. It's, it's I know. extraordinary. This is what makes him such a great lyricist, too, is that he writes lyrics that are singable. You can sing them in a fast tempo, for the most part. I mean, every time I'd meet him, I'd say, uh, hey, sing New York, New York, or do the, the, the poetry. To oh, New that York. thing. Yeah, with George and Russell. Boom. Yeah, George Russell. And he would do New he would, York, New York. Right, <laughs> but he had a cold. Never, never lost it. Hmm. So, now speaking about losing it, um, how do you remain a vocalist all these years, playing, singing constantly, and not lose your voice? Well, you do lose your voice mm -hmm. occasionally. Um, the problem is, uh, your instrument's part of your body, and your body is susceptible to elements that are out of your control in large measure. Airplanes, dryness, microbes, illness. Um, times four with Times group. four, yeah. yeah. And um, the traveling, you know, uh, jet lag, being tired, being hungry, not sleeping well. Um, so every singer I know have, has their own remedies for this. Because you're going to, I mean, I lose my voice. I do. I, and it, it comes from getting sick and then having to sing on it. Mm. Yeah. Uh, the good news is if you're in a group, you can kind of hide in the group <laughs> and your partners can cover you and, you know, you can change the repertoire a little bit, you know, so that's, that's okay. But if you're a soloist, forget about it. But there are things I think that you can, I mean, everybody knows these, these rules for keeping your voice are very simple and obvious. Get enough sleep, drink a lot of water, 
wash your hands a lot, warm up, um, don't yell, don't go to a loud nightclub and speak loud, uh, moderate alcohol use, um, steam is good, sleep is your friend, you know, it's all kind of common sense stuff. So what happens when you're jet lagged and you can't sleep? Well, there are drugs for that. Okay. <laughs> I find that the CBD oil, just the non-psychoactive, let's make that clear, really does the trick. Mm. I mean, I, when I, I take some of that with me, for sure. And all, there's another natural remedy that I use, that Formula 303, which is valerian root, basically. That works for me. Since you ever get up on stage and it's your turn to do your solo and nothing comes out? Uh, that's never happened, but I mean, I, I've been terribly, terribly hoarse. Terribly hoarse and sick mm -hmm. on stage. We all have, uh, but yeah, it's, t it's the worst. It's the worst feeling because you feel you can't do your best and you can't really, you have to, on the other hand though, uh, limitations, I think, are a creative uh, aspect. I mean, if you have a lim limited range, you have to be creative with it. And maybe you come up with new ways to sing something. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, if you, you have a part to sing, so you can't really fool around too much with that part. You know, you had mentioned before how much you guys rehearsed before you had those five yeah, tunes we, together. Yeah, we used to rehearse a lot. So what would be an average if, like, to get a tune together that you guys are comfortable on stage, how many hours, how many weeks? Well, things have changed now. But, I mean, in a general way, like, after the arrangement is written, I think it would take maybe two or three days to get through it. Just get through it without working on dynamics or um, a nuance. Um, just getting the notes without working on blend. And then, then the shaping starts. And then it's like singing on, we, we rehearse a cappella mm -hmm. with just piano. I mean, just playing, none of us really play well enough to accompany but, but to start off with the notes, but we rehearse a cappella. So then it's a whole nother level, getting it stage ready, singing it on microphones. How are we going to stage it? Are we gonna move or not move? You know, so it's, it's a whole process. Would you say that uh, Joe Zavano piece was the hardest piece you've ever done, or is there something else? Well, there's many things that have been difficult. Um, <laughs> don't get me wrong. Um, also, uh, this last album we did, The Junction, we would get, sometimes we get charts the night before we went in the studio. Wow. You see, this is the new world, really, of digital technology. I can get my, my part, my chart, the night before, go in and record the whole thing the next day, piece you, by piece. So you guys record individually? We used to record on one mic. Yeah. That was the difference. Together. I mean, and then double it. So I used to stand on a box, <laughs> and we'd all be the same height, relatively, and then we'd mark our places with tape and get the blend that we wanted together. So is everything doubled? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'm trying to think what the hardest. I mean, vocalese was extremely challenging because it was all a lot of those jazz classics and those complicated lyrics and solos. We rehearsed six months for that record. Wow. And then we went on the road and shed it wow. with John in tow. And he would critique us. Wow, That's, those were the days of big budgets. Huh? Those were the days of the record companies. Wow. When, and support. I mean, Ahmed Erdogan, that was the other thing that I, you know, might not exist today. There were actually a few record companies where there were genuine music lovers in charge with taste. And Amateur again was one of those. And people. what was he like? <laughs> he was one of the most exciting people I ever met, interesting people I ever met. Mm. 
because he had his foot in so many worlds, legit, legit. You know, he was an ambassador's son. He was very well educated. He knew a tremendous amount about music and old music, mm -hmm. you know. And, but he was also a rock and roller and a party person and loved to hang out and was funny as hell and loved to eat and drink. Wow. He was a gas. Well, you know, y your life and your career, your early opportunities are so different from uh, what our students here have. I know. So what do you, and you teach here, you're a, you're a professor here at NYU now, and uh, what do you tell students? What do you, I mean, the thing that's interesting about you is you never started out thinking, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win 10 Grammy Awards, damn it. And, uh, and maybe now students start out saying that, you know, because, they, well, I'm going to school, I'm investing in myself. What, there's, a, there's a dichotomy there with uh, the way we're, we're pursuing music and art because we, we don't know where we're going to end up. We, none of us know. No, none of us But what, what do you, have you had any uh, heart-to-hearts with students and said, well, make sure you do this and you do this? Well, we, I mean, I, I teach with Lauren Kinnan, who's the alto in New York Voices. So it's, it's really fun to do it with, in tandem with somebody. And she's a generation younger than me. So the kids, I think, have the benefit of both our experience. Now, Lauren is a trained musician. I mean, all of New York Voices are trained. They went to school for music, you know. They are Darman Meter, you know, he's so accomplished as an instrumentalist as well. Um, they're very involved in the academic world, all of them. And, and the four of us came together by chance, you know, complete magic kismet. And none of us really are trained. I mean, Alan was trained as a, as a music teacher, and then he was a Broadway actor. Mm -hmm. So he has all of that. I think it's incredible for a musician to gather skills you know, in school, really, to learn to read, to learn to sight read and sight sing, and to learn history, music history. You know, that's incredible. But I, I, I also stress the importance of, of, of uh, feeling things and experiencing everything and being open to different styles and um, choices, choices in your, in your voice um, and um, he, using your ears, mm -hmm. you know, as well as your brain. Because there comes a time when you're singing when you've got to shut your brain off. So if we look back now, if you look back on your life and you say, singer, nurse, what would you have... Uh... I, I don't think I would change anything. Now I'd like to go back. I really would like to go back to school now. For that? For nursing? Yeah, for medicine. For medicine. I wanted to be a surgical nurse. Hmm. The excitement of it all, you know, the blood... <laughs> the organs. <laughs> but, um, okay. <laughs> no, I'm still interested in that. Well, so do you have any parting words of wisdom for our our students tonight? Well, the best advice I ever got was one word from John Hendricks, mm -hmm. and that was listen. Listen. That's the shortest jazz poem ever written. <laughs> Listen, okay. Um, I like it. All yeah, right. I like it too. All right, Janice, thank you so much. A hearty handshake to you. That's a loyal to hearty hand clasp. <laughs> All right, thank you.